it's time to share secrets and insights from fellow entrepreneurs. If you're looking to grow or start a business and you're a game changer, then keep listening to Avanti Entrepreneur for great advice from your host, Dave Mamano, America's Entrepreneur Coach. Hey, Avanti Tribe, Dave Mamano here. Just want to thank our sponsor, Paychex. You know, Paychex, they make it simple for businesses of all sizes to pay and manage their team. They make payroll easy with employee pay options, including direct deposit, checks, pay cards, and so much more. Founded over four decades ago to relieve the complexity of running a business so that the owners can focus on what matters most. Above all else, and more than any other company, Paychecks makes it simple. Visit AvantiEntrepreneurGroup.com. Go to our partner link and check them out. They're offering you a free month of payroll just for giving them a shot as an Avanti Tribe member. Give them a shot, folks. They really help this podcast to be possible. Really appreciate Paychecks. Now, enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Avanti Entrepreneur Podcast. I am David Mamano, your host, and we are here to help entrepreneurial achievers and business owners and leaders move forward so that they can reach their potential. I do this by interviewing the nation's best business movers and shakers. Today, I have on the show, Mike Goldman. Mike, welcome to the show. David, thank you very much. Great to be here. Excellent. So everybody, Avanti family, I want you to learn more about Mike. Pretty cool guy. I've been talking to him for a little while. Uh, Mike Goldman is a nationally recognized speaker, author, and business coach. He founded Performance Breakthrough in 2007 to help mid-sized companies achieve dramatic business growth by working with leadership teams to ensure that they have the right people, strategies, and execution habits for growth. He has coached companies uh, from the local entrepreneur uh, to the Fortune 500. Mike has over 25 years of consulting experience. Throughout his career, he had companies like Verizon, Disney, Polo Ralph Lauren, Chanel, Dillard's, Liz Claiborne, Levi Strauss. What a slacker, Mike. You should go for bigger clients. <laughs> Uh, Mike's clients value his vast experience and personal approach. His dedication to serving his clients is always executed with incredible passion and energy. His no-nonsense practical style enables individuals and teams to uncover opportunity and achieve revolutionary results with laser focus. His book, Performance Breakthrough, The Four Secrets of Passionate Organizations, has become a gold standard for any business. In his book, he details the four secrets for creating a more passionate, productive, and profitable organization. The book was a labor of love for Mike as it transformed him both professionally and personally. Mike, again, welcome to the show. Excited excited to dig deep with you. Thank, I was going to say, you said it all. I've got nothing left to say now. Not the love. I love it. That's <laughs> right. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. Take care. <laughs> so, Mike, first of all, why uh, why did it transform your life? Why did this book uh, that, that we're going to have in our show notes, by the way, everybody, if you go to Avanti entrepreneur.com you can click on the show notes but why why uh, did it transform your life yeah it's an interesting story so the book is called performance breakthrough the four <laughs> secrets of passionate organizations and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book but I have a uh, I have a son that's got something called Asperger's syndrome if you're familiar with what that is and for those of you that might not be not be it's kind of a, a high functioning form of, of autism if you know what autism is and uh, Way back, and he's 24 now, uh, but uh, right before I wrote the book, he was about uh, he was about 12 or 13 years old, and my wife and I happened to be at an Asperger's conference, this, uh, this Asperger's support network of, of parents, and there was a gentleman on the stage named Dr. Brooks who wrote a book called How to Raise Resilient Children, and he was talking about how we should raise our children, and it amazed me because everything he said uh, almost sometimes to the word and phrase is what I was coaching and consulting my clients to do for their employees. So I said, there's got to be an idea there somewhere that, that matches this up. And I wound up writing this book. It's told in the form of a story and it's semi-autobiographical about a dad at the time whose business is going down the tubes and he's got a son with Asperger's syndromes and he sees this therapist and he winds up taking what he learns from the ther family therapist and applying it in his business and it turns his business around. So I was able to take those concepts, but make it very personal and make it to some degree about me and my son and, and me and my family. 
Sounds fascinating. I think the best stories are always, you know, the most personal stories, right? So it sounds like you did a little Patrick Lencioni type of book here. Where uh, big, big fan of Lencioni. I, I tell everybody he stole his style from me. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. He's, he's <laughs> talked about that. He's talked about you. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think everybody loves a good story. Uh, everybody loves a good fable. Obviously, in, in your case, it's a, it's personal. So I'm I'm, uh, I'm excited to check it out. And congratulations on taking uh, you know a challenge in life and, and obviously making it into something very uh, helpful for not only you and your family, uh, but for your clients. So I think that's a, a fantastic way to uh, kind of transform a challenge. So uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. So Mike, I want to ask you about. How did you become a coach, right? Because I think the best coaches are uh, the people that um, have, have some experience, right? To say, like, this is why I am uh, you know, able to be a good coach. What were you doing before you were coaching? Yeah, well, the, the first half of my career, uh, about 14, 15 years, I worked for uh, large consulting firms, if you're familiar with Accenture. Back when I was with them, they were where well, they were still Arthur Anderson, not the guys that got in trouble years ago, but the other guys. And then I worked for a company called Deloitte. And, and back then I did consulting <clears throat> for Fortune 500 companies. I mean, if you were in a five to $10 billion company, we wouldn't even look at you. Um, did a ton of travel. Already mentioned I had a son at home. I have a daughter as well, a younger daughter, but I had a son at home with some pretty significant issues. And I was gone Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday, every week. My house was kind of my hotel on the weekends. Uh, my wife was also working, but, you know, taking care of the kids full time. So it was difficult. So went from there and said, I've, you know, I've got, I've, I was about 40 years old. I said, I've got to do something to change my life here. So I wound up deciding to start my own business. It wasn't a coaching business at the time. I actually bought a staffing and recruiting franchise. As much consulting as I did, I'd never had my own business before. Um, that was a wonderful way to take several hundred thousand dollars and throw it out the window. But I learned a ton and started actually doing workshops while I had the staffing firm is a way to differentiate myself. <clears throat> I said, I'm going to start doing these things I call called performance breakthrough workshops to help my clients, uh, not only with their staffing, but how could they get the most out of their people? How could they improve employee retention? How can they pr improve productivity? How, how could they improve morale? And I started doing that as a way to market my staffing and recruiting firm and realized that that was the business I should be in, not staffing and recruiting. So I went back <clears throat> to my consulting roots although became a coach instead of a consultant. Uh, and the difference in my mind is as a consultant, you've got to be a consultant. You've got to be really smart. And as a coach, you've got to be okay being really dumb. You know, as a coach, my job, I had an industry focus uh, back then, and it was it happened to be retail and apparel for many years. And I had to be smarter than my client sitting across the table. As a coach, I have clients that are in digital marketing, e-commerce, uh, uh, plastic surgery, helping kids get into college, uh, debt consolidation, all different industries. So my job is to be dumb and ask them the dumb question that they're not asking themselves. So I uh, started that about 12 years ago and haven't looked back. It's, it's really been, uh, I felt like everything else in my career was, was leading up up to that. Uh, fantastic. And I, I love how you are humble and vulnerable and saying that you would be dumb. And I think that's a sign of great leaders, right? And great cultures, consultants. They, you know, when you're, I love my friend, Cameron, Cameron Harold says, when you are the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room. Yeah, well, I've got a, you know, a fairly new client I started working with about six months ago. And, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about how I work with clients. But, you know, one of the, the, the challenges they have that he didn't realize uh, is I said, you know, he asked me after a few meetings, how do I think they're doing? And they're doing okay. But I said, I said, the problem you've got is there's nobody around the table that can challenge you. There's nobody around the table that has the passion you have, the intelligence you have, the assertiveness you have, uh, the education you have. And I said, that may make you feel smart every day, but it's going to kill your company. You've got to surround yourself with people that are as good or better than you are. And that's, that's a big challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs. For sure, for sure. Have, a, have an ego, but put it in your back pocket and surround yourself with 
uh, instead of yes men and yes women, uh, no men and no women, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and be okay with it. And you don't always have to listen to them, but at least be take a deep breath and, and let the dust settle with, with whatever their concerns or comments are and, uh, and see if it makes sense. I think a good leader listens to everybody and, and takes the feedback and then ultimately, you know, based on the information presented, uh, they'll move forward with their own decision, uh, but they'll explain right, why they made that decision so that everybody knows at least they were listened to and then could also understand what the decision is otherwise. Yeah, yeah and hopefully they've got, they've got two more things there is hopefully they've got some accountabilities on their team where they don't have to make every decision, yep. where they've got, and I know we've got some entrepreneurs that here that are listening and that are just starting out as well as some that have been around for a while. And yeah, when you're just starting out, you know, every decision is you looking in the mirror and making a decision. But <clears throat> over time, if you're surrounding yourself with the right people, you've got others who could make decisions and you've got to create, uh, you know, a la Pat Lencioni and Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And if you haven't read it, go read that book right after you read mine. Yeah. Uh, but, but you've got to create a safe environment for, for people to challenge and debate so you can come up with the right decision. Absolutely. Uh, so, Mike, I have another question for you. You know, 20 years ago, if you were a coach, it meant that you were coaching like a sports team, right? Like, oh, you're a coach, you're, sport, you're coaching your son's uh, little league. Now, a coach, you know, it really, a lot of, lot, of, lot of coaches in the business world, right? And I actually had somebody, somebody asked me the other day, what does Avanti do? And I said, well, you know, we help uh, entrepreneurs grow with coaching services and you know, mastermind services and events, et cetera. And he kind of cut me off. He's like, oh, another coach. He goes, David, let me tell you, I'm getting, I'm getting coaching fatigue. Everyone's a coach, life coach, business coach. And, you know, uh, I stopped and I, at first I got a little defensive, but then I'm like, you know, he's right. <laughs> you know, I, I go on LinkedIn and Facebook and I think it's all, uh, you know, with, with good intentions, but there, there are a lot of people out there that are quote unquote experts giving advice, life coaching, business coaching, et cetera. Some are good, some are not. Um, but you know, whether they choose, you know, you, and I know you, you, you're at this point in your career, you're working with some bigger companies or if they choose Avanti or Gazelles or EOS. I mean, there's some great, great programs out there, right? Um, what, what do you think objectively should a company uh, the business owner look for when hiring a, 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 a skilled coach that can be helpful to their business? I'm going to start with what I think the most important thing is. And, it, and it's usually, frankly, it's the thing people think about last. And I think the most important thing is you, and in my case, I, I don't do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. I work with executive teams and I coach the CEO, but I work with the team. So for me, you know, in the type of coaching I do, the most important thing a company can do is say, you know, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, as a leadership team, do we click with this coach? You know, is this somebody that we want to work with day in and day out? Maybe he's brilliant. Maybe he's well-read. Maybe he's got this beautiful set of tools from, uh, you know, from Gravitas or Gazelles or, or EOS or Action Coach or whatever it is. He's got this great set of tools, but man, if we got to get together with this guy every month, uh, I'm calling in sick because this is not someone I want to work with. So I think the most important thing is that you've got personalities that click and, and you've got someone who not only, I mean, absolutely having, uh, just being, being a smart guy or, or you know, hey, was, I was an entrepreneur and ran three businesses and sold them and now I'm going to go be a coach. Um, sometimes those are the worst coaches. You know, like if you go to a, you know, think, think baseball, sometimes the worst coaches are, we're, we're the best players, but they're not very good at being a coach. So you've got to make sure you can connect with that person. You do have to make sure that they've got the right set of tools. They're not just a good, smart person that's going to tell you what to do. They've got a set of tools that are going to help you figure it out and that are going to help you put in place uh, disciplines around having the right people and the right execution. So once you've figured out the strategy, you can keep tweaking it and you're executing with discipline and accountability. So I think, you know, for me, I always think it's really important that I don't know, not only do I meet the CEO, I meet the leadership team and we've got to connect. And my best sales meeting is I'm not selling them anything. I'm coaching them. And if they want more of that coaching, they're going to hire me. 
if they don't want any more of that coaching, that's okay. They're going to go hire someone else. Yep. No, very good point. Very good point. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a sa- the best salesman or saleswoman uh, become sales manager and they're terrible at the managed part, but they're, you know, so they're, they're great at the job of actually selling, but they're not great at the job of managing two different skill sets, right? A lot of times the entrepreneur is great at running a business, but they don't have the patience or the empathy to be a, uh, 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 just a sensitive coach, right? right. A, lot, a lot of good coaching is a lot of just listening and, and, and sitting there and entrepreneurs aren't always great at that, right? <laughs> and and it, me- it means you've got to put your ego aside, yep. which is hard for, for some of us entrepreneurs. And, and it also means that you have to help the client figure out what the right action is for them. The way I might grow my business may be different than the way you should grow your business. And if I try to tell you the right thing to do based on what's in my head, I may screw you up. So I've got to be able to put my ego aside and like you said, listen, so I can help you figure out what the right action is for you, not for me. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. So Mike, let's dig into it. You're, you know, when you work with the company, um, you know, I, I looked at, at, you know, your website and you're, you're focusing on helping people, helping companies, number one, get the right people, get the right strategies. And then last but not least, the execution habits, right? So tell us, tell us about, maybe first tell us, you know, what, what do you see in a lot of companies that are stuck and how does your process help them get unstuck? Yeah, the first thing I typically see is, you know, a company may say what they lack is strategy. When I talk to a prospective client, they want to talk strategy. You know, how should I grow? What geographies should I expand into? What new product lines uh, should I introduce? But, you know, when I dig into it, most companies that I start working with have a combination of, of two problems. And one is they have not surrounded themselves with the right people. Number two is those people they've surrounded themselves with are not executing with any discipline. Sometimes I'll hear from really frustrated CEOs and entrepreneurs. How do I hold my people accountable? What do I have to do? Fire everybody? You know, what am I going to do? They're not doing what they say they're going to do. But then, you know, I'll ask them what the word accountability means, and they really don't know. You know, what's the difference between accountability and responsibility? And how do you hold people accountable? So, so we've got to start at the real basics of understanding how do you define an A player in your organization? How do you, how are you creating the right culture? What is that culture you need to create in your organization? And do you have the right disciplines for executing? Even if you've got the right folks on board, what are you doing to make sure you're aligned around the right priorities? What are you doing to make sure you're measuring the right things? What kind of meeting and communication rhythms do you have to make sure that you're able to zig and zag as you need to and you're holding people accountable? And back to that word accountability, do you even know what accountability means? You know, if you, if I say to you who's accountable for that and you say, well, you know, Joe and I are going to do it. Nobody's accountable. Because you're going to point the finger at Joe. Joe's going to point the finger finger at you. Accountability is is who owns it, and it's always and only one person. You can have many people responsible. One person's accountable that I'm going that I'm going to look towards. So I actually have an ebook called Right People, Right Execution. Not that strategy isn't important. Strategy is critical, and and I'm actually going to be in Costa Rica for a few days next week, uh, uh, getting trained myself in, the, in this great new set of strategy tools that I'm going to start using with my clients. So strategy is critical, but what I find the biggest problem is uh, with new companies I work with is wrong people, lack of the right habits and disciplines around execution. Excellent. So tell us, I think, you know, execution is such a big problem for entrepreneurs because, and, and I'm, I'm guilty myself. New idea every day, every week, uh, and and so we we have a great idea. We we start to build that mountain, and then we get distracted with another idea, and we move to another mountain, and then another mountain, and we never finish a mountain, right? Uh, and I, I think entrepreneurs that knock it out of the park somehow are super hyper focused, getting that one mountain done and high as it can go, putting somebody on top of it to run it, and then going to build another mountain. Uh, so how can entrepreneurs super hyper focus built in the discipline and the habits 
so that they can execute and, and knock it out of the park before they move move on to the next big idea. Yeah, and, and it, it comes down to the right level of planning, but let me be specific there because when people hear the term planning or strategic planning, especially in my history of working with big Fortune 500 companies, and man, we would spend months on a strategic plan, the most beautiful PowerPoint slides you've ever seen, um, and then it, it goes in a beautiful binder and it sits up on the shelf and gathers dust. Yeah. So it doesn't work. And I asked myself for years, you know, why doesn't that work? And, and there's a simple reason that that kind of planning doesn't work of once a year or some companies once every three to five years, we're going to create a five year strategic plan and it's going to fix everything. Why doesn't it get executed? And it doesn't get executed more than anything else because three to six months after that plan is created, the world has changed. Right. And people like to say, oh, things are changing faster than ever. You know what? When I started 30 years ago in consulting, things were changing pretty fast, too. You know, that's not a new thing. But uh, but what I do with my clients and I think what's of critical importance is absolutely you do have to look long term. I'm a big fan of, of you know, Jim Collins, uh, built to last and good to great. Uh, and and uh, the idea of having a big, hairy, audacious goal that's, you know, he says 10 to 30 years out. I can't think 30 years out. I'm typically 10 to 15 years, but I'm a real fan of what's that flag on top of the mountain. And then if we're going to get there in 10 to 15 years, where do we need to be in three to get there? If we're going to get here in three years, where do we need to be in one year? But here's the thing that's typically missing from folks is if all you do is create a one-year plan, you're going to fail 95% of the time. What you need to do is break that down and you always need to plan out what's the next 90 days. What's that big rock? What's that most important thing for the next 90 days? Because the chances of the world changing in 90 days are pretty small. It might change. But what leaders need to do, whether they're doing it for themselves or whether they've got a leadership team around them, is they need to create these 90-day priorities that drive them. And it's short enough that it's not going to change very much. And it's also, you know, it's long enough that you're going to get something real done. It's also short enough that you get a nice little fire, you know, fire under your butt sense of urgency to get it done. If I say I'm going to lose 25 pounds in the next year, but then you put a cupcake in front of me, I'm going to say, I got a year, I could eat that cupcake. But if I say I'm going to lose eight pounds in the next 90 days, I'm not touching that cupcake because I've got to reach this 90 day goal that's coming up pretty quickly. So I think it's about understanding the long term, but it's about creating processes around these shorter term goals, shorter term measures that you're holding yourself and your leadership team accountable for. Excellent. So Mike, let's say someone uh, has just started a company, right? Brand new company, couple months under their belt. And, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to build a plan just to get through the first year. Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that you're going to tell that person to have a, to really maximize the journey of their first year? Yeah, I, I think the first thing for, for, for an entrepreneur at that level um, is don't get started. On, I believe don't get started unless you've got some cash in the bank to get you through the tough times. You know, there's a book I read years ago called The Dip uh, by Seth Godin, great little book. And he talks about how many businesses fail right before they're about to succeed because they run out of money. Yeah. So you've got to make sure, I mean, entrepreneurs, you know, bless us all. We're, we're optimistic people. And sometimes that can kill us yeah. because we just know we can quit our job tomorrow. And even though we've got about a month or two of expenses sitting in the bank, that's okay because this is such a great idea. What do you mean break even point? My break even point is going to be tomorrow. I'm going to make this work. And, you know, most businesses, you know, you, you better make sure you have a year or two of expenses sitting in the bank so that you could make the right decisions. Because if you're making the wrong, really bad short-term decisions just to put food on the table, you're going to kill your business before it gets started. So I think you've got to have the right, uh, uh, you know, the right, the right cash in the bank. And, and you know, some are going to go out and get, get funding to, you know, to do that. And, and that, that could be great because it can get, get you going. It could also make you, you know, real dumb with how you spend that money. So, so that's one. And, and number two, and this is going to depend on how fast you're growing, 
but there's nothing more important than surrounding yourselves with the right people. Now that could be a few things. Now, if you are large enough, that may mean surrounding yourself with the right team, the right leadership team, uh, even if it's not a leadership team, the right people around you to get the job done. If you're a solo entrepreneur or it's you and one or two other people, it's around surrounding yourself, I think, with the right support team around you. And that may mean the right accountant. That may mean the right attorney. That may mean the right coach. That may mean, and I, and I think this is really important, have the right mastermind group that you're working with. From early on in my entrepreneurial days, you know, I had a mastermind group, an EO or YPO. You'd call it a forum group. But surround yourself with like-minded people who are doing what you're trying to do, or, or, or a little ahead of that, who can pat you on the back when you need it, who can kick you in the butt when you need it. But just because you're in business for yourself doesn't mean you have to be in business alone. You can't do it alone. So whether it's your team or whether it's the support network outside of that, whether it's a spouse. I mean, I almost failed many, many times in, in a couple of businesses that I started. And if it wasn't for a really supportive wife, and we've been married about 28 years now, um, I, I wouldn't be here today. So you've got to have the right support people around you. Important stuff. Thank you, Mike. That's great. All right. Before we go, what are some of, besides your own, what are your favorite books that you would recommend to burgeoning entrepreneurs? Yeah, there, there, there are a few that, that I would call classic at this point. I mentioned Jim Collins, Good to Great. Um, uh, I probably read that book about five times. For me, that's the Bible. Um, I know it's written as if it's for a big business, but any business can take advantage of those learnings. Uh, you know, first who, then what, get the right people on the bus before you figure out where to go. So, um, uh, good to great, amazing book. Uh, I love anything Pat Lencioni, Five Dysfunctions of a Team uh, is a great one. He's got a few others. And then recently, a couple of great books, uh, Measure What Matters by John Dewar, talking about his experience at Google and other places around uh, something called uh, Objectives and Key Results. Uh, and there's a book called The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, which is just a great book that talks about how to, how to elevate those everyday moments uh, with our, our employees and with our clients. Excellent. Excellent. Great, great books. Uh, how, about, how about a favorite quote to, uh, to inspire the Avanti family? Wow. Favorite quote. I always remember quotes, but I never remember who they came from. That's okay. Um, but, but, quote. So, someone a long time ago, and, and let's just attribute it to me, make believe I said it. Uh, so, someone a long time ago uh, told me as an entrepreneur, you have to, to have a philosophy of hire slow, fire fast. Yep. And typically as entrepreneurs, we do the opposite. It takes us forever to fire someone because it's a really hard thing to do. And then once we let them go, we're short staffed. So we rush to hire the next person and we make the same mistake all over again. So we fire slow and hire fast and you really need to do the opposite. I think I know who said that. Jack Welsh, GE. Was it Jack? All right. It was Jack. Yeah. So you're, you're in there you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good one. Uh, and last but not least, Mike, we have some fun questions here at the end, as you can tell. If you could spend an hour with somebody famous from history, who would that be? Wow. Um, Teddy Roosevelt. Nice. I like Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt. I've, I, I read a trilogy, uh, you know, on him years ago, and he's just someone, you know, started out, if people don't know, as a very sickly and weak child. Yeah. Um, and just amazing persistence uh, became the opposite of that. In fact, there's a story that he was in the middle of a speech and was shot yeah. and he finished the speech. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and party or not was just real big on telling party. it like it. What's that? It's the bull moose party. The bull moose party. Yeah. Yeah. He got, he got a little crazy there at the end of his life, but, <laughs> uh, but just, yeah, man, sp spending some time with that guy would be a blast. Yeah, I read a couple books about him as well, and I, I know that uh, he just uh, one day quit the day-to-day the -day life in New York City and moved out west to be a cowboy for a couple of years. And, yeah. And, uh, and then uh, – and I remember one fact about him too, that on the same day his wife and mother died. That's right. 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's I, right. I, Just I never, incredible, I, incredible guy. I never had that answer, and that's a very good one. And I, I would agree with you. He's definitely someone I, I would want to spend some time with. So, uh, very good. Well, Mike, this has been super fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. If people want to get in touch with you to learn more about you, uh, contact you, et cetera, what's the best ways? Best way is, is my website, which is very simple, mike-goldman.com. Uh, they can get my, my book, uh, Performance Breakthrough, the Four, Dysfunct uh, the Four Dysfunctions. Whoa. Performance Breakthrough, the Four Secrets of Passionate Organizations. Okay. I've got Lencioni on the okay. brain. Um, that they can, get, uh, they can get on Amazon. Excellent, excellent. Well, Patrick Lencioni, I mean, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Uh, I appreciate uh, Renee Tell connecting us. She's a great woman, and I'm going to yeah. call her to, to say that we had a great interview, and hopefully you agree. And I, I do. Wish, I wish you uh, uh, continued success and continue uh, really being able to help a lot of people and clients along your journey. Thank you so much for your time. David, thank you very much. It was fun. Thank you, uh, everyone else, the Avanti family, for listening to the Avanti Entrepreneur Podcast. I appreciate your support. Make sure to check us out on the web at avantientrepreneur.com. Make it a great day and stay awesome. Thank you for listening. Head over to avantientrepreneurgroup.com for show notes and more helpful advice from entrepreneurs like you. Continue to find your entrepreneurial rhythm at the Avanti Entrepreneur Podcast.